Hello and welcome to another Author Shell Board Game Review. This week we're going to look at Rockwell. Rockwell is a combination of worker placement game, mixing with an area control with a couple extra mechanics such as auctioning, player movement over a modular board, and also throws in just a little bit of financial mechanics just to make the game a little bit more interesting. The game is designed for two to four players, ages 14 and up. They say the average play time is about 90 minutes. My experience has been closer to the two hour mark, especially with a four player game. It's from a fairly newer designer by the name of Bruno, and I'm not going to try to pronounce his last name because I don't want to butcher it, and I know I will if I try, and it's published by Sit Down. If you want to learn how to play Rockwell and also see a sample gameplay, make sure you also check out my tutorial video where I take a little bit of time, explain to you fully how to play Rockwell the game, and then go into a full game where I play the game through a couple of rounds so you can see how all the mechanics work together, and you can judge if this is a game that you're interested in. Rockwell was a Kickstarter produced game and it, I believe the shipping date was end of December, possibly early January. And from all my research, it looks like it's either going to retail for $59.99 or it's going to retail for $69.99. Either way, either for $60 or $70, I think you're getting a lot of components for your dollar value here. Not only are you getting a lot of components for your dollar value, you're getting a lot of really good quality components for your dollar value. Starting with the player boards and the rest of the cardboard that comes with the game. This game uses very thick, hardy cardboard. We're not talking about the cheap, flimsy stuff. We're talking really good quality cardboard that you expect from almost the quality of an actual game board that you play from your standard companies like Fantasy Flight Games or any company along those lines. You're talking some really good cardboard for the player boards. And that quality of the cardboard continues whether you're talking about the achievement tokens that come with the game or if you're talking about the delivery tiles. They're all really good quality cardboard really thick cardstock, very hardy. These are not components you have to worry about falling apart. The phase boards are also really good quality, the same thickness as the player boards. We're looking at a very thick, hardy cardboard. There's three of them. Again, these are double-sided. You'll learn that if you watch my tutorial. These are all double-sided boards, depending on how many players you're playing the game with. They all have artwork on them. They look really good. And again, I just want to reemphasize, this is really good, thick cardboard, not that thin cardstock that's becoming more prevalent in some of the more I'd say better produced board games and you're probably going to see me commenting on that on a future review I should have come up pretty soon for another game which is retails for $100 and then as a price comparison I wouldn't even spend $60 for that game just look at how cheap the components were in comparison to Rockwell. Now the only thing that isn't actually really thick cardboard in this entire game besides for the wooden components and the cards themselves are the player shields and even these are made out of pretty good card stock they're thick enough that they're going to stand up pretty darn easily for you not going to have problems with them falling over. They can take a little bit of abuse. They're not going to have caused any problems. They all have artwork on them, which is really a nice touch. Again, it just shows that they put a little bit of extra production value into this game. The game does have cards. These are full-size cards, not your smaller micro cards that you see in a lot of games these days. They're good thickness on them. They're not thin. They're pretty much what I almost equate to a typical playing card. They're a good enough quality that I'm not even going to bother sleeving them. And then finally this game comes with a lot of wooden components. You have wood for all your resources and these are standard size cubes mixed in with larger size cubes to show large amounts of resources. You also have wooden components for the player pieces and you also have these vice president pieces that are very large. These may be shaped like meeples but they're actually I'd say probably triple size meeples to use them as a comparison to other games. They're really large. Again all the components for this game are extremely fantastic. If I had to lay one complaint against any of the components for the game, it would be for the game board itself. Now the game board itself is really good, it's made out of good quality cardboard, but my problem with it is that instead of using a standard jig cut that you'd expect in more of your typical board games, especially your dungeon crawlers where they have like a jig cut where the pieces fit in very nicely and you don't have any problems right there, they decided to use a, best way to describe it is like a herringbone kind of piece that flips in sorry, clips in right between the pieces and connects them together. Now, it does a good job holding these pieces together, but the problem is you're going to be constantly pulling these in and out, in and out, and you're going to start noticing that after a while that your game boards, and this is only for the four outer rings that hold the game board itself, but it's going to start fraying right here. My suggestion, and this is what I had to do, is there's a process you can do where you take some glue, you water it down a little bit, and don't just water down glue and just jump in this. There's videos that tell you how to do this. Make sure you watch one of those so you do it properly. And basically you're going to take that glue and you're going to paint it, again watered down, you're going to paint around the edges here. Some I recommend doing because these herringbones, they have a tendency as you pull them in and out, in and out after a couple plays, these are going to start fraying a little bit and these little herringbones are also going to start fraying a little bit. 
So I definitely treat them with the glue there and it's gonna cover that one problem that I had with the game board pieces themselves. Now I'm not trying to suggest that these pieces are poor quality because they're far from it, but after about the fifth or sixth play, I started getting that frame, so I definitely had to do that little gluing process, and that's definitely held them together a lot better after that. Overall, whether this game retails for $60 or $70, I think it's a fantastic value. You're getting a lot of wooden components, you're getting some fantastic cardboard. Again, not cheap, chintzy cardstock, you're getting a fantastic cardboard. Again, the only cardstock is the shields. Everything else is either wood or cardboard, and plus the dice, but they're typical four-siders, they're good. Overall, really good price-wise, a really good package here. Every time I do a review for a board game, it's always important for me to take a few moments to discuss the family friendliness of the board game, and also take a few moments to discuss the perfect player account. Now, we all know that some games just seem to fall apart at certain player accounts, and some games are just perfect when you hit that perfect player account, so it's always good for me, in my opinion, to take a few moments to discuss that and see why I think why those various player accounts make this an optimal or a suboptimal gameplay experience. Rockwell the board game lists as a board game for ages 14 and up, and I actually think that's a pretty darn accurate age suggestion for this game. Now visually there's nothing wrong with this game, there's no bad images you'd be afraid to share with younger players, there's nothing that's going to be questionable displayed on the board where you have to keep younger eyes away from the game, especially when you're playing it. And we know what I'm talking about, we have those games where there's sometimes suggestible images or there could be some little graphic so we don't want the younger players to see it. That's definitely not the case with Rockwell. The case with Rockwell though is that this is a very deep, very strategic game that has multiple levels to it, multiple phases, multiple things going on and you really have to be paying attention to a lot and planning your strategies really far in advance. There's also some mathematics required for the game. Now most of it is pretty simple mathematics. You sell seven cubes that are worth $800 a piece, you know that you should get $5,600. Of course, after a few beers, you may want to pull out the calculator before you start figuring those things out because that's what beer does to you. And we all occasionally enjoy a really good beer when we're playing board games. So, you know, a couple beers, some of the mathematics may get a little more troublesome, so definitely have a calculator on hand. The game also has some semi-cutthroat mechanics to it. Now, especially that's going to come into play when you're doing the vice president placement in the early stages of every round. Now, what I mean by that is it's very easy to block out another player because if you look at the second phase board, there's always one less spot available for this part of the game for the amount of players. So for a four player game, there's only three spaces available on the stock marker board. If you flip that over and see the two player game and the three player game, since the only difference between those two is that you use an AI player in a two player game, so there's still always going to technically be three players, you see there's only room for two vice presidents in a two or three player game. So again, this is going to be a very contested spot. Whoever gets the biggest auction gets their vice presidents on the board first is going to prevent that third or that fourth, fourth player from placing it on that board, which is again part of the strategy, but it can also be a little bit cutthroat on that aspect. And that cutthroatness also applies to the main board here. You can kind of ride on the coattails of other players, which is part of the strategy. You don't always want to do it, but sometimes it's advantageous to do it. You can also use bribery counters to prevent a player from maybe possibly getting a move that you project that they may have been seeing. If you happen to have a player right here and you have the access to the bribery tokens and you know this player is trying to get down here, you can always just mess them up and pull them off to the side so they can't get where they're going. Now you have to do a little strategizing and do it, but it is a possible option. So again, that does add to the fact that it is possible to screw with the other players in this game. And sometimes being screwed with is something that younger players don't necessarily like. So basically what I'm saying about Rockwell is this game is a little bit too complex for the younger minds. It definitely has some direct antagonistic player powers in this game where you can directly interact and interfere with the other players. And all that complexity just goes to put together a game that, while very enjoyable, especially for the older players and the adults, definitely isn't a game I suggest for younger players. Probably the youngest I'd suggest for this game is probably 12 and up, maybe even 13 and up just due to the complexities of the game, unless you have a fairly bright child, then maybe 12 and up. Rockwell is also a game designed for two to four players, and now I'm going to preface this with a quick personal caveat that's about me. This has nothing to do with this game, it's just something that I don't enjoy in games. And I very rarely enjoy games that have an AI player to compensate for lower player counts. I'm not a fan of it in Seven Wonders, and again, I'm not going to be a fan of it here in Rockwell. And Rockwell is one of those games that has a mechanic. Now, in Rockwell's case, it's any time you have two players, there's going to be a third player, which is basically going to be an AI player. Now, the mechanics for the AI player are done very, very well. There's nothing wrong with them. They flow very well. It's just a couple extra steps that you're going to have that you're going to have to share with your other opponent that you're going to have to do for the third AI player. 
and the AI player is affectionately referred to as Al, AL, kind of a joke. But unfortunately, I'm really not a fan of these kind of mechanics. Again, like I said in Seven Wonders, I was not a fan of it there, and I'm definitely not a fan of it here. I just want to preface and say that it works. You can play it two players, but just personally, it's not my go-to kind of game style. Anytime I have a choice between a two-player game that requires a third AI kind of mechanic or a game that's just a pure two-player game, I'm personally going to pick that pure two-player game every single time. Now, I personally think Rockwell shines best as a four-player game, but it's still very, very good as a three-player game. Now, I like it as a four-player game because you're going to get more interaction between the players, especially since now while the markets may change in a three- and four-player game, the amount of pieces that will change, the one constant is always going to be the same size of the game board. So the more players you have on this game board, the more you're going to have what, in my opinion, is the best aspect of this game, and that's going to be the player interaction. So with four players, you're going to have more pawns on the board. You're going to get more players interacting with each other. More players trying to basically screw over the other players by moving on the spaces, predicting what the other players are going to do. And you have much more of that fun mechanic in the four-player game. I also felt more of the pressure from the race of trying to get those achievements earlier and trying to get those deliveries order earlier in a four-player game because you had more players going after those exact same achievements. Now in a three-player game, it does tell you to remove some of the achievements. But with that four-player game, you saw those achievements disappearing quicker because you had four people going after them. And I really, really appreciate that aspect of the game. So overall, saying all that, I definitely think Rockwell plays best as a four-player game. It's still very, very good as a three-player game. And it's also very playable as a two-player game. But do that AI component as of the third player, I'm not exactly a fan of this game as a two-player game. Although, to be perfectly fair, if you don't mind an AI player and you don't mind in Seven Wonders as another game to use as an example, a very well-known example, that's why I keep throwing it out there. If you're okay with that kind of mechanic, you're definitely going to mind it here in Rockwell, and you can definitely enjoy this game as a two-player game. Prior to hearing of Rockwell, I'd actually never heard of Bruno, the designer of this game, and I actually think this may be his first published design. If I'm wrong about that, please somebody correct me, but I do believe this is his first design. And I have to say, Bruno did a fantastic designing job designing this game. For a first time design, this game flows extremely well. This game is designed very well. Everything goes together very well. Now, learning the game can be a little bit complex, and I'll get to that when I give you my negatives about this game. I always like to start with the positives and then move to the negatives of a game. But learning the game can be a little bit challenging because there's a lot going on in the game and also there's a couple things with the rule book but I'll get into that towards the end of the review here but overall he did a fantastic job de designing a very enjoyable game that I enjoy quite a bit at the three and four player account I've already discussed it about the two player account so I'm not going to get into that again but I really enjoy this game with four players I've also never seen uh, any other games by this company sit down now apparently this company has been around for a while they've designed some other games and I'm extremely intrigued and interested in checking out some other games because I see how well it did with this game. Now, in all honesty, this game has some fantastic components. I was really surprised when I opened the box, saw everything that came in the box, and the quality of everything. I really, I know I already went over this, but I can't emphasize enough just how high quality these components are. You got very good quality wood, you got very good quality cardboard, and you got very good quality cardstock, and everything just looks really good. There's some fantastic artwork in this game. It's done extremely well. The player shields all have artwork on them. The game board for the phase boards all have artwork on them. These, the main game board itself, when you flip it over, just nice little touches showing the railroad tracks. It looks fantastic. This game is pleasing to the eyes. And you can tell the company who did just the extra couple of steps that makes a good game and turns a good game into a great game. And this is definitely one of those cases where a good game has been turned into a great game just be adding those by adding those extra touches such as the artwork and the fantastic components. Now I know I already prefaced this that the rule book can be a little bit challenging but the game itself once you understand how to play the game is very easy to understand. The game flows extremely well once you've gone over that initial hurdle. You have the game broken down into phases. The components of the game make it very easy to help you remember this. You have your main phase board, your phase two board, your phase three board, each one of the player boards themselves are broken down extremely well, helps you remember everything. Some very good design decisions. You don't have to pull up in the rule book once you've learned how to play this game. Matter of fact, except for one minor rule, I would say that you'll never ever have to break open the rule book when you play this game. There's only one thing that isn't listed on any of the player boards, and that's the cost to hire these subcontractors right here. 
So if you just remember, it's 1,000, 1,500, 2,000, 2,500. That's the only thing you're ever going to have to memorize out of all these components because everything else, once you learn the game from the rule book, you'll never pull out again because the components do a fantastic job of making the game easy to remember and it flows very, very well. Now, I personally, with my worker placement games, my Euro games, I really like a lot of direct player interaction. A Euro game without any player interaction is usually not going to be too high on my enjoyment radar. A good example of that, and I hate to throw other games under the bus when I explain games, but it helps you understand my viewpoint so you can see why I give a game a good or a bad review. Give another perfect example here is the original base game of Dominion. And I know a lot of people like to run to the defense of Dominion, but the base game without the later expansions is really a solo experience where you have a whole bunch of players just playing a solo game. This is not one of those games. This game has a high amount of player interaction. You can cheat people out of various phases by just properly placing your vice presidents by having good advanced strategies there. There's also lots of direct player interaction on the game board itself from moving your pawns around the board, hiring subcontractors, there's the ability to come in from behind, score points, force things to happen by just watching what the other players are doing and that's something I really appreciate about this game. I also like how this game is a race. Now you decide the ending of the game but the game itself is actually a race. You're racing to get those achievements faster than your opponents. You're also racing to get those deliveries out there faster than your opponents. Because the earlier you're able to do these, the cheaper the deliveries are going to be. And also for the achievement aspect, the more victory points they're also going to be worth. And I like how this game forces you to feel pressure all the time to go out there and get those accomplishments before your opponents. But you still got to balance everything and not go too fast as you put yourself in a point where you're not playing efficiently anymore. I also like the hidden resources and the hidden scoring in this game. It's always nice when games throw in the hidden scoring because it prevents you from overly mathing out the game. You never quite know where the other players are standing. And this really, in all honesty, reduces the analysis paralysis. Analysis paralysis comes in from games where you look at your opponent, you see that they're three points ahead of you, and you try to figure out how do I get four points this round so I can come ahead of my opponent. In a game that has hidden scoring and hidden resources, this has minimized where you're more concentrated on what you're doing and try to how to most efficiently help your score versus constantly trying to figure out how to get ahead of player A who happens to just have a couple more points than you. So I really like games that have hidden scoring and hidden resources and it's done very well in this game. I also like how the player order is dictated by auction which adds a little bit of a kind of a tabletop aspect to the game. Now if you ever played Spartacus you'll understand exactly what I mean here where you can do a little tabletop about the auctioning and kind of fake out the other players and say man I really need to win this auction I better really go in all you know as much as I can and then reveal your action is a hundred dollars while you just watch a whole bunch of people throw extra money out because they also need to win the auction and I like games that offer a little bit of subtle table talk like that it's kind of a nice touch I also like how you can upgrade your teams you can upgrade the your teams in di different various aspects and it also adds a lot of replayability to the game this can be a game where I'm going to try to level up my workers, get them to level 4 as quick as possible so I can get to the deeper strata to start getting the bigger, higher paying resources. Or am I going to try to hedge my bets and try to go for a mine shaft in the hopes that this mine shaft is going to pay out really well and give me some resources long term? Am I going to go ahead and try to get those early deliveries out and try to make the extra victory points from those deliveries? Or am I just going to go as fast as I can, try to get all those achievements and try to end the game as quickly as possible because you control the ending condition for this game. Once you've reached one of the two ending conditions, that's pretty much the final round of the game. So if you know in your mind that you got the most of the achievements because you've been watching where everything has been going on, you can try to bring around that end game as quick as possible. And hopefully if you plan properly, you may end up winning the game just because you ended the game when you felt you had the most victory points. And that's also what I like about this game. And this kind of dovetails into the final thing that I really do like about Rockwell. There are multiple paths to victory, multiple ways to score your victory points, and you don't feel like you're pigeonholed into one direct strategy, otherwise you're not going to win the game. You can either go for those deliveries, and hopefully that's the best strategy. You can also go for the achievements, hopefully that's the best strategy. Go for a combination of the two, watch what the other players are doing. It's all something you can do, and it's very, very cool. I also like the semi-randomness of the dangers that they threw in the game with those danger cards. You never quite know just when one of those dangers are going to pop up. Now, I haven't, I don't think I go over this in my tutorial video, but every one of these strata cards, a third of the deck is going to be dangers. Each one of these is going to be six cards. Two of those six are going to be danger cards. And that goes for every single layer of it. You have two, 
you have four non-danger and you have two danger that's going to be for every single strata so there's always a gamble do you go for the extra insurance or do you go for the safety commissioner expecting bad things are going to happen or do you just get the luck of the draw on your side it's kind of a nice aspect kind of a nice little bit of gambling there and i really like how they do that and that balance goes for all the strata that goes from all the way from three all the way up to ten there's always two dangers and four non-dangers in every single one of these decks finally if you go check out the original kickstarter for rockwell you see that they actually had planned a lot of micro mini expansions for this game so it's obvious that bruno has a lot of ideas for the future of rockwell and i wouldn't mind seeing all of those thrown together as one future expansion for the game some of the things i've already seen just by checking out that kickstarter page is there's a diamond expansion where you throw in these diamond cards into these various strata which are going to give you different things there's also the randomized market board which is going to be fluctuating values which is something that's in the kickstarter and again i don't know how these mechanics exactly work but you can check out the kickstarter for goals that were not reached and understand that there's definitely some future plans for this game that will in my opinion only add to the fun factor of the game now i went on about a whole bunch of positives for this game and i think these are positives are definitely warranted for this game this game marries mechanics and gameplay very well to form a very good game there are some negatives about the game though and while some of them aren't that important to some players they're definitely negatives are worth mentioning now the biggest thing that i have to mention as a negative is that this game can be very brutal to poor planning if you spend a whole bunch of uh, probably not even a whole bunch i'd say if you had about two or three bad rounds where you just plan pretty poorly I can pretty much guarantee that you're not going to be able to make a comeback and win this game. This game can be brutal, especially if you're playing with some aggressive players who manage to get a couple of achievements ahead of you because they're paying more attention, planning further on into the game, and planning their future moves. They're going to come out on top, and there's really no way to make that comeback because this is definitely a game that rewards the faster gameplay. The faster you reach those achievements, the faster you plan, the better you plan, the more your score is going to go up and the better your score is going to be at the end of the game. And if you have a couple of really bad rounds where you're just not planning too well, not really thinking, and not doing some good strategizing, you're probably not going to be able to come back from this game and pull out a victory. And that may be a negative for some players. Some players like games that kind of give you a little bit of a helping hand when you fall too far behind, and this game doesn't. Now, while I personally, I like games that don't give the helping hand, where if you just, if you play stupidly, it's going to basically kick you in the teeth and say, play better next time. I like that in some games especially my euro style games but not everybody kind of likes that so i want to definitely preface that if that's something that bothers you you may want to consider that before you pick up rockwell also now this is something i held off towards the end i also want to comment on the rule book now i realize that most of my complaints on the rule book are going to be a difference of languages now this is a game that was originally designed in french and the rule book is translated into english now while most of the rules Actually, I'd say probably about 99% of the rules are in this rule book, and I can't really think off the top of my head if there are any rules that aren't actually in the rule book. The problem, though, is that this rule book, while it's translated into English, there's some verbiage in there that's a little bit more unique, and it's also compounded by the fact that there's a lot of, call them mini rules in this game, a lot of situation rules that are going to pop up, and it makes it even harder to remember how to play this game. A good example of what I mean by that is for example, the situationalness of handing out these resources whenever you flip over one of these cards. Now your first, maybe second time you play this game is going to be kind of confusing remembering exactly how to hand out the excess resources when you have a split between who's going to get what. You know, it's hard to remember the first time you play, that's a mind shaft. And then your second requirement, your third requirement, that's a little bit hard to remember. Plus there's some other situational things going to pop up there. The other thing is going to be the mine shafts. Now the mine shafts, a level 1 mine shaft can only be placed on a tile that has not been revealed. But once you learn level 2 and level 3 mine shafts, you can place them anywhere you want, including on a tile that's already been revealed. And that's another one of those little minor details that may be missed the first couple times you play the game. Another good example is the subcontractors. You can never hire a subcontractor more powerful than the current layer you're in. If you're in the level A layer, that's equal to a level 1 layer. You can never hire more than a level 1 subcontractor. If you're in the D layer, it's equal to the level 4 layer. You can hire anywhere from a level 1 through a level 4 subcontractor. Again, it's all these little minute details that make the game a little bit more challenging to learn the first couple times you play it. Basically, I'm going to say that the first couple times you're going to play this game, expect the game to go run at least two and a half hours. Have that rule book off to the, off to the side. Make sure you're pulling out for every single step, or you, know, you can always watch my tutorial video too. I think I cover everything pretty well there. But overall, the rule book, 
from the translation all the small minor rules details it's going to make the game a little bit challenging to learn the first couple times you play it the nice positive though about this is that once you know how to play this game it's very easy to play the game flows extremely well there's lots of player aid reminders throughout the board from the phase boards themselves the player boards very nice reminders just understand that the first two maybe three times you play this game expect to forget a rule or two and then the final points I've already covered again I'm, like I said earlier I'm not a big fan of AI making up for shortcomings in player accounts two-player game this game does require an AI and you know this isn't unique to this game there are a lot of games that have AI to make up for shortcomings and either games thrown in AI or you have things such as I'll use another example Terra Mystica which is another fantastic Euro game but with only two players it's not that great a game now it's not bad but one of the biggest mechanics of Terra Mystica kind of disappears when you have two players this game they decide to throw an AI to make up for the deficiencies in a two-player game and while it works really well again I'm not a huge fan of it now if I have one final knock against the game I have to say that this game does take a little bit of time to set up now this is definitely one of those games where you want to have the other players helping you set the game up because it's going to take probably about 15 minutes the first couple times you set this game up you can either pick up a Plano box which is going to help you setting up the game and also do note the game does come with an insert which is divided pretty well but there are so many components they actually don't fit back in these wells too well luckily they do include a lot of bags helping you store the game but I definitely would recommend you pop this out pick up a Play-Doh box or two and get everything all sorted it's going to help you really get this game set up a lot quicker when you play it overall I think Rockwell is a great Euro style game it incorporates a lot of mechanics that blend together very well matches the theme of the game but still makes the game flow very well it makes the game very easy to play once you understand the mechanics of the game the game has enough built-in randomizers to guarantee that the game is not going to play exactly the same every time you play it and there's also various strategies you can play throughout the game also increasing the replayability of the game if you're looking for a really good three to four player worker placement game i can definitely suggest checking out rockwell this has been another off-the-shelf board game review for rockwell the game if you want to learn how to play rockwell make sure you also check out my tutorial video where i go over how to play the game and give sample gameplay if you have any questions, leave them in the YouTube comments below. Thanks for watching.